live fairly close. The plan tonight is for me to just give a little bit of an overview of what pop bar hives are, what you can do with them, how you manage them and things. And then the fun part is we're all going to build top bar hives. There's Kevin. So uh, we're going to do that. And then uh, there's a couple meetings coming up later on. We'll talk about those a little bit. Try to answer any questions you've got. Uh, Dorn, owe him a great round of thanks because he prepared the jig for constructing these top bar hides and everything. If anything needs to be made out of wood, Dorn can build it. So uh, he's the expert on this. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, the easiest way to get a hold of me is my email, just sean.wright at uky.edu. I do have a Facebook page as well for horticulture. Uh, I didn't put it on there, but if you go on Facebook and look up our cars, RCARS, and horticulture, it'll take you right to my Facebook page and things. Uh, try and keep people updated with meetings and things that are going on there. Uh, anybody here currently using top bar hides? You like them? I, this is my first experience. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, Why did you decide you were interested in it? Well, the, I had a Langstrom pipe, mm -hmm. and uh, it was just too heavy. Okay. I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't manage it. I could Yeah. So I thought I a friend of mine in Lee County has a few of these, and she's the one that said, well, suggested trying to. Okay. Great. Well, uh, we'll go over some of the advantages and disadvantages here. And weight is actually one of those uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, they are fairly easy to construct. These are, compared to a Langstroth hive, which is very precise in the measurements and things, these also, if you can measure with a tape measure and use a handsaw and things, you can build one of these because you don't have to construct a lot of frames and things like that. Uh, there's two basic designs, a Tanzanian, which is just a square box, and those are designed so that you can actually use a regular frame that would fit in the Langstroth hive right in those. They just have the square sides on like this. A Tanzanian hive or a Kenyan hive is just sloped a little bit. Um, the disadvantage to this is when the bees build the comb down without it having an angle on the sides like you get with the Kenyan hive, it's a lot more weight on the edges of the comb and it's a lot more likely to break. Uh, that's why the Kenyan hives are a little bit more popular unless you're using a frame within that. If you don't want to use a frame, uh, I would recommend the Kenyan hive. If you do have a lot of frames left over from a Langstroth hive and you wanted to just convert them into a Tanzanian hive, you could do that just as well. It would fit right in there. Uh, I've seen some like this that are actually called coffin hives that are six, eight foot long and things. Uh, so it's just a matter of preference, really. Uh, for a given depth, these are a little bit easier to manage than that. Uh, based upon the names of these, you kind of get the idea that these are designed for rural areas, uh, third world countries, developing countries, which is kind of the background behind these top bar hives. They're meant to be used in developing countries or by people that don't want to invest a lot in equipment. They're fairly easy to manage. You don't have to have an extra, well, we'll go over all the stuff you don't have to have in a minute. Um, advantages, they're easier to work because it's just one frame at a time. So when you take one bar out of a uh, top bar hive, this is one that we built several years ago. Uh, the design that Dorn came up with is a little bit different than this one, a little bit better. Uh, we'll take a look at this one when we're all done talking here. And you can see that some of the issues with this one is there's places for small hive beetles to get in there and hide, and Dorn designed his so that we don't have issues with that. But when you take out one of these bars on a topper hive, you're looking at working 18 square inches is all you're going to open up on this. So you can imagine you're only having bees coming out of 18 square inches of your hive versus 150 square inches, 156 square inches when you take the top off of a Langstroth hive. So you're going to have a whole lot more bees coming out looking at you for one of these 
as opposed to this, which is one of the reasons why you don't need a lot of fancy equipment. Uh, myself, I almost always do wear a veil when I work bees, uh, just because there are times that I've not worn one, or even when I have worn one and the bee got under my veil and gotten stung on the nose and on the eyebrow and on the lip and the ear. Uh, it's kind of painful. Uh, but, you know, a veil, you don't have to use them. I know people that never use them. In terms of gloves, uh, sometimes I wear gloves, sometimes I don't. When I do wear gloves, I tend to like just the cheap nitrile gloves that you get at Rite Aid or Walgreens. Get a box of 100 of them real cheap. Uh, they're sting proof, they're disposable. I like those better than the big heavy beekeeping gloves. When you put these on, you can imagine that uh, you lose a lot of the sensitivity and things. I mean, yes, you do get the portion of your arm that's covered by the gauntlet, but you know, with this, it covers up to here, and you know, so I'll sometimes wear a suit, sometimes I won't. The purpose of a bee suit really is to keep your clothes from getting dirty and to make it look like a beekeeper. Uh, that, that's really the purpose for a bee suit. I mean, I'll go out just in a Carhartt jacket and some jeans and things. I would recommend not black jeans because bees are more prone to sting dark colors than light colors. Uh, you know, if you go to the Mountain Mission and they've got some painter uniforms up there, real cheap, you can buy some painter clothes, just old white stained up paint clothes if you wear that. But uh, you do have a little bit of exposure area if you use these kind of gloves, but you know, if you're going to keep bees, you're going to get stung. That's just kind of the nature of it. You don't want to get stung a lot. You've got a beekeeper not wearing any gloves at all. I don't keep mean bees. If my bees get mean, uh, we'll go in and requeen them. That's one of the compromises I made with my wife is we won't keep mean bees around. So we do, we keep gentle bees. And if you have gentle bees, there's nothing to open up a frame and just pull it out. But, you know, they'll land on you and kind of come along and look at you, but they shouldn't be stinging you. You can always tell if bees are getting anxious too, and sometimes they'll come up and just kind of tap you on the head if you don't have a veil on. Sting around. You know, just kind of say, hey, you're getting kind of close there. But, uh, you know, very nice, very gentle. One of the disadvantages when you harvest a, uh, we'll talk more about harvest in the future, but if you harvest a comb from a top bar hive, the way you do it is you pull it out, you cut it off with your pocket knife and throw it in a bucket. So you lose that comb that the bees have made during that year. And so the bees do need to be making for us. With a Langstroth hive, if you pull that frame out and put it in an extractor, sling it around to get the honey out, you can put that frame back in and they don't have to rebuild the comb. Advantages and disadvantages, it does take a lot of energy in terms of uh, honey and pollen for bees to build comb. And, you know, it's just an energy intensive process for them. It's what they naturally do, so it's not like you're forcing them to do something unnatural, but it, it does take energy that they could be putting into foraging or packing away pollen or nectar or something like that. So there is a cost to it. An advantage to that though is, and, you know, I've talked to beekeepers before that say, I've had the same frames in my hives for 10 years. Well, the reality is if bees are out foraging, they're going to be picking up pollen, they're going to be picking up pesticides from the environment. I mean, we live in a place where, you know, I don't care, unless you live out on tip top or somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and even up there, there's a chance that one of your neighbors is going to have sprayed their garden with some type of pesticide. So most places around here, bees will forage for a distance, a radius of three miles. So that's a pretty good sized area that a bee will cover. And the idea that there's no pesticides in that area is pretty uh, scarce. That's why if somebody says that they're uh, marketing organic honey, they're not marketing organic honey. And it's one of those arguments that the beekeepers have had with the USDA right along. Because you can't guarantee that in a circle with a nine mile radius around that be pi r squared, what's the area? 3.14 times 3 miles, 9 
uh, whatever. Anyways, so huge area. So you're looking at all kinds of area that you can't tell me that you can guarantee that nobody in that area has only used organic pesticides. Uh, so that's why when people say they're organic honey, it's like, no, it's not. Uh, but so if you like comb honey like I do, you really don't want to have old comb in there that you're chewing on because you're going to be chewing on some pesticides and things. What's the area of a... Uh, 9.42. Okay, so pretty good sized area that uh, the bees forage on. So less residual pesticides, and that's important. We are seeing carryover of pesticides. One of the big surprises for me as a beekeeper and as a horticulturist here is that we found the chlorothalonil, which is a fungicide that most gardeners use, is actually something that the bees are picking up and putting into their combs. And that is one of the compounds that is somewhat, it's not directly shown that it's related to colony <coughs> collapse disorder, but there is correlation between chlorothalonil and weaker hives, the weaker development of bee larvae and things. So the less pesticides you have in your beehives, the better off you're going to be. Uh, disadvantages to a top or hive, probably the first disadvantage, and I didn't even bother to put it up there, uh, just because the best way to learn about beekeeping is from another beekeeper. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of people that are doing this that are around there. Most people are keeping Langstroth hives and things, not top or hives. There's a few around. There are good sources of information out there, books, YouTube videos, uh, beekeeping meetings, and various other things. But that's just one thing. A lot of this, like any type of beekeeping, there is no single best way to keep bees. Uh, everybody has their own way of doing it. You get two beekeepers in a room talking about the best way to do things, and you'll end up with three or four opinions because they'll argue with each other, and then they'll argue with themselves. So there is no best way. But uh, you have less adjustment in space for volume. Uh, you know, you've only got this much space to work with, however long your top bar hive is. With a Langstroth hive, you just keep adding supers on top of them as high as you want to go and lift them up. Uh, you do have to somewhat manage, uh, if you have an empty frame in that, in the brood nest, you need to move a bar from the back where it's empty up into that brood nest, just to kind of keep your brood nest expanding and things. Uh, you want to make sure that the hive goes into winter full of stores. That's standard for any type of beehive. Making sure the cluster is at one end. Uh, in a top bar hive, they're more prone to spread out versus in a Langstroth hive where they go up and down. Uh, just something about the construction of it, they tend to spread out more. So you want to kind of make sure they're down there. And also the comb is more fragile just because it doesn't have the frame that it's attached on, on all sides. It's just attached onto your frame guide, your comb guide on top. Uh, one thing that I didn't include in this, when I talked about you don't need a lot of fancy equipment, the one thing that I forgot to include in here that would, it's a nice thing for most people to have with them is just a long hacksaw blade or a long knife because occasionally bees will try to attach the side of their comb to the side of your box. You need to come in and cut that away from the side of the box. So when you go to pull it out, you don't break it. Uh, so just a long hacksaw blade that you can slip in there and cut the edges off of your uh, comb away from the box. Normally, they're not going to do that. They're going to try and do more just like this and keep it away. But once in a while, you get some bees. Keeping bees is like raising kids. You can guide them to do things. You can suggest they do things. You can manipulate them a little bit to encourage them to do something. But you can't make bees do anything any more than you can make kids do anything. Uh, so you can always tell new beekeepers, I'm going to have my bees do X, Y, and Z. And it's like, no, you're not. You can encourage them, but you're not going to make them do anything. Uh, top bar is just a flat bar with some type of comb guide. Uh, Doran and I decided to go with this triangular piece, and he can talk to you about how we built that. I have seen people that they'll just take the top bar and they'll rip a slot through the middle, uh, kind of like our uh, follower board here. Uh, they can cut it, rip it, and insert pop it, sickle sticks in there. Uh, my own feeling is I'd rather have them have this to attach it to than a popsicle stick. Uh, just 
because when I throw these around, this isn't as likely to break as a popsicle stick or anything. And it's really, it wasn't that much work to make those cone guides. The important thing is the size of your top bar so that the bar width uh, maintains the B space. There are no spaces or gaps. When you have all your bars into your top bar hive, uh, there's just enough space at the end of it for the bees to get in and uh, work their way down in there. So it's very nice. With it, what we're building tonight, what you're going to take home with you, you'll have something that looks just like this, only better with the design door made. And the only thing you're going to need to do is get some bees. Uh, what I do with mine is I put a sheet of masonite or plywood on top of this, just on top of the bars, uh, and then a cinder block or a rock or a brick or something to hold that on. Uh, some people put a sheet of tin on top of it. I've got some pictures in here to show you that as well. Uh, but we didn't include the sheet of masonite. We figured people probably had that laying around or a sheet of tin or something. Uh, starter strips, some people will just take... Uh, you can buy foundation, and if they do cut that little slot in there, you can insert a little sheet of foundation in there and use that as a cone guide. Just something to say, tell the bees, hey, this is where you want to start building your frame from. Uh, we did this. This was kind of nice. Uh, these plans that are in your thing are from Michael Bush. Uh, his website is bushfarms.com. He's probably one of the gurus of hot bar beehive beekeeping in the United States has a real good website. He's not strictly a top bar beehive guy, but uh, it's one of the ways that he does use it. And again, there is no perfect way. He'll tell you the same thing. But these plans that come are some that he's designed uh, through here. And this is what Jordan based his plans on. Um, I think we had, what, $437 worth of stuff in our equipment which worked out to be like $43 in wooden wear uh, for your beehive. So, you know, you could build one of these for 50 bucks, a little bit of uh, <coughs> nails and things that went into that. Uh, this one, I actually put some boiled linseed oil on the outside of it. You could stain it, you could paint it. You don't want to put anything on the inside because that bees don't move into a painted uh, empty hollow tree where that would kind of freak them out. But certainly, uh, boiled linseed oil, stain, paint, whatever you can get cheap. Uh, with my Langstroth hives, if I need to paint them, I go to Walmart or Lowe's, and I go to their clearance rack where they have a mixed, mismatched paint that somebody mixed the wrong color and buy that because it's cheap. Uh, doesn't have to be white. Um, we gave you all one size bars in here instead of the one and a half and one and a quarter. We made them all one and three eighths. Uh, just because you can do that, the bees will make that little bit of adjustment. And then you don't have to worry about which bars are for the brood comb and which are for the honeycomb. I like to keep things as simple as possible, but uh, Michael Bush has two different size bars in there. And if you look at this, you can see uh, the difference in the two bars. It, it, comes along after a while, you can kind of pick it out real quick. But just a one and three eighths inch bar is standard, and the bees will adjust that extra eighth of an inch in there one way or another for you, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, we didn't give you any legs because we didn't know if you wanted to put legs on it or how you wanted to do it or anything else. Uh, but here's the materials that you would need to build more if you wanted, just like this one. Um, Dorn, as we get out there, he can talk about anything else that he wants to, uh, just kind of how it was constructed. Uh, this is some pictures off of Michael Bush's site. Line it up, spread them out, nail them on. How do you keep the queen out of the uh, honey storage area? They want to keep a consolidated brood area because then the nurse bees are all right around the bee larvae. And so if you just put uh, if you need to expand so you have more brood, you just put an empty bar in there. You can slide this real nice. Uh, one thing with keeping bees is the more you get in there and fool with bees, uh, I know it's interesting and it's fun and all that, but the more you get in there and fool with them, the more irritated they get. That's a mistake I made my first year as a beekeeper. Everyone wants to get in there and open it up and see what's going on. But uh, bees don't like having their homes disturbed any more than you do. So the less you have to manipulate them, the better off you are. And this is how you harvest them. 
You simply get yourself a bucket and a chef knife or a pocket knife. You cut the comb off of your bar, drop it in the bucket, and then you put it in another bucket where you crush it and squeeze it, let it drain through some cheesecloth. No fancy $400 extractor needed or anything. And you can have some uh, honey that way. Just drill some holes in the lid on your five gallon bucket so it can drain out, down into another bucket or something. Um, so you've got two buckets, one on top of each other. But that's if you've got a lot of them. If you've only got one, you can simply take some cheese cloth and a rubber band and hook it on top of your bucket, crush it in that and strain it and do it that way. Or you can eat the comb honey. I like comb honey myself. so. That's another option for you. This is one of the nice things about top bar beehive keeping is it's inexpensive. No fancy equipment. You know, you don't have to have an extractor. You don't have to have an uncapper. Um, you know, you don't have to have a bee suit. A smoker isn't necessary. You can certainly get one if you want. They're relatively inexpensive, but you're not really going to use it. Uh, some of the old time beekeepers, they wouldn't even use a smoker anyways. They just use a cheap cigar and use that to smoke them with. Um, two things you don't want to do if you're ever working around bees is don't eat bananas before you work your bees and don't drink beer before you work your bees because the aldehydes in the bananas and the beer uh, are similar to the attack pheromones that the bees will release and you'll annoy your bees to get stung a lot more. But, uh, you know, a cheap cigar or something, some people will use that if they're just going to go out and work their bees as well. Uh, crush and strain is a good way to do it. Uh, just a sheet of tin on top of my hive is fine. Nothing fancy at all. Uh, a follower board, you'll all get a follower board when you go, which is just simply this. This is just used to reduce the size of your top bar frame. You know, when you get your bees, your bees will come in a three pound package like this, and we'll talk more about that later on. But uh, you don't want them to have to have this whole thing work with. They'll want a more constricted area. So you'll put this about half to a third of the way down your box and just let the bees work that area in there. Uh, ours just has a top entrance on it. Uh, the bees come up in the front down that little slot and in. Some people will actually go ahead and drill some holes in the side to give the bees another entrance. Uh, just the size of a wine bottle cork and then they can close it up if they want. Gives the bees another entrance or exit. Uh, you can do that if you want. You don't have to. Uh, some people like screen bottom boards on those. We didn't use them on the top of our hive uh, just because that's an awful lot of open area on the bottom here in Kentucky. Uh, you could do that and then you could get yourself some of these old campaign election signs that are around and tack them onto the bottom to close them off in the winter if you wanted to. Um, I like screen bottom boards on Langstroth hides. I use them to help manage Varroa mite. Uh, I also, you know, I think they're good for airflow and things, but on a top bar hive, um, I really don't, I'm not a fan of it. Some people are. If you don't think you're getting enough ventilation, I would probably recommend drilling a couple of small holes in the side and you can cork them off with a cork and things like that if you wanted to. Uh, just giving you an option, some people will do that. Uh, another design of a top bar hive. There's another design. You know, you can make these as fancy as you want. That's a nice pretty one there. They even have brass hardware put on it so they can open up the sides on it, brass hinge there. Uh, Germany uses a lot of these type of hives. These are all made in top bar hives in Germany. This one has a bottom entrance where the bees come in right there, land on the bottom. The advantage to that, uh, advantage, disadvantage, you get a lot more drafts coming in the bottom and the bees can get chilled. Uh, advantages when you have dead bees, they can just push them out the bottom rather than having to carry them up and out and down. Um, I've never asked a bee which they prefer, so we just do it the way we like it. You put in a fancy observation window on the side. Uh, the rustic look. Here's one that does have wine bottle corks in the sides. Uh, this one has two windows and a built-in slot for a feeder on the end. 
Uh, nice fancy tin roof there. They even made a nice little landing pad on the side for the bees. This one, they must have been a fan of uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy because they wrote something in Elven script on theirs. I can't translate it because I don't speak Elvish. But uh, that's, you can get these as fancy as you want. You can get them as simple as you want. This is a top bar nuke. Uh, when you want to get your bees, if you're buying a Langstroth hive, you can buy a full hive, you can just buy a package of these, or you can buy what's called a nucleus colony or a nook. And they come in, it's just a five frame like mini box. When you buy a top bar hive, there aren't many people that are making nucleus colonies for top bar hives. So you can make your own out of a Rubbermaid container and put that in, or you can just build two of these, cut it in half and slap it in on each other end and do it that way and then you've got your own nucleus colonies that you can start with. Uh, this one made out of a barrel, again very simple. The idea with these is they're very low tech, very low management required. Uh, cut your barrel in half, lay your boards on top. Good sources of information on how to keep these Two magazines that I recommend, Bee Culture and American Bee Journal. Both of them are different, both of them are very good, they're just about exactly the same price. Bee Culture is geared more for the hobbyist. Um, it has some real good information in it. Uh, I like it. I like American Bee Journal. American Bee Journal is geared a little bit more towards the commercial end or the sideliner. If you're a beekeeper, the way we talk about beekeepers is if you keep up to, you know, 20, 25 hives, you're a hobbyist. You're not going to make a lot of money. You're not going to lose a lot of money. You know, and overall, you're going to break even and have a lot of fun. If you get between 25 and 75 hives somewhere in that ballpark, you're considered a sideliner. You've got enough hives that it's kind of like having a part-time job. It's going to keep you busy enough that your weekends are going to be kind of busy, your evenings are going to be kind of busy. Uh, if you get up 75 to 100 hives, you have a full-time occupation on your hand at that point. Uh, American Bee Journal is kind of geared a little bit more for the sideliner of hobbyists. Uh, you'll see advertisements in here for uh, forklifts and things that you won't see in bee culture, but they're both very good journals, you know, for, uh, what, $31, you could get an online subscription to both of them and uh, see which one you really like. Online forums, there are some people that really like the online forums and those sorts of things. Again, two of them, B-Source, B-Master. Uh, B-Master tends to be a little bit friendlier community, not that the ones in B-Source are mean, nasty people. Uh, beekeepers are, you know, they're opinionated. Everybody has their own way of doing that. Uh, I've seen things get a little bit more heated about discussions on B source and on B master. On B master, the moderators tend to do a little bit better job about keeping everybody in line and not letting things get too far out of hand. Uh, YouTube videos, in terms of general beekeeping, lots of them out there, but ones in terms of top bar beehive beekeeping. Michael Bush, who again, uh, this is of the design that we use. Les Crowder is another big name in top bar beehive beekeeping. If you go to YouTube and look up any of their videos, uh, there's a lot of information on there. The Kentucky State Beekeepers Association, ksabeekeeping.org. Uh, Ty's got a meeting on the 16th, which is Wednesday at 6 o'clock here in town. Talk about organizing the uh, county beekeepers. Anything you want to say about it, Ty? We had some interest to uh, come from other beekeepers, and you know what I found is there's a lot of people in the county that's got bees, you just don't know. It, you know, so what we're trying to do is maybe get those guys organized, and maybe you know, start their eye on, hopefully monthly or so, maybe to to uh, kind of just network and, and do things together, as associations. So Great, might as well. Uh, there are other counties that do have active beekeepers. The McGoffin County has a good-sized beekeepers group over there. I've talked to that group before, and I think they get between like 30 and 45 people at that one. Powell County's got a good group. Morgan County's got a good group. Um, I'm not sure if Wolf County has a club or not up there. I don't think so. So 
but there are other ones around. But certainly I'd encourage people to join the Kentucky State Beekeepers if you're interested. Uh, do want to put in a plug, January 21st is the Eastern Kentucky Beekeeping School. Usually registration starts at 8 o'clock if we don't get snowed out. Uh, runs till about 3.30. Registration fees anywhere from you know, 20 to $30 in that ballpark, I think. Great meeting, lots of door prizes, good food, lots of sessions, uh, real good information down there. Uh, there's also one that they have over in Frankfurt every year at Kentucky State, sort of a Central Kentucky Beekeeping Association. There's one up in Moorhead, but I haven't heard when that one's going to be. Uh, usually one up around Maysville as well, so there's some around as well. In terms of suppliers, uh, these are all companies that have nice catalogs, lots of good information. Kelly Bees is over in uh, Grayson County in Clarkson, uh, Kentucky beekeeping business. Encourage you to support them. Not that theirs is any better than anybody else's. As Doran and I were talking earlier today, you know, unless it says it's made in the United States, if it's not made in the United States, it's coming from China. In which case, you might as well buy it from whoever's got it the cheapest, right? So, uh, and that's one nice thing too with this meeting in Hazard, is if you do know you're going to order beekeeping equipment from anybody like Kelly, Kelly has always come. If you let them know ahead of time, they'll come to this meeting and they'll haul your equipment in and save you the shipping costs. So you can save a lot of money that way. Also, uh, for anybody that's getting into bees now, needs uh, to put your list together for Santa Claus. Some of these companies will offer special rates in December, free shipping and things. So you can let your uh, wives, spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends, significant other friends know that, hey, this is what I'm interested in. And by the way, some of these companies have free shipping coming up in December. Uh, but all these companies are real good. Uh, none is better than the other. Kelly, as I said, is a Kentucky company. Brushy Mountain really became known for their eight frame equipment, Langstroth Hive. You know, if I was going to do Langstroth hives, I like eight frame mediums uh, just because of the size and things. Uh, Dedant has been around forever. They now have an office in Frankfurt. Uh, they've been expanding around. Better B. Miller's has been around. Man Lake has been around a long time. Rossman is known for building cypress woodenware if you want cypress stuff that holds up well. Pigeon Mountain's a fairly new company. There's some other smaller companies out there as well. Um, in terms of, let me talk just a little bit now about what you do. Once you get your hive built, what do you do? You need to get some bees in it. You can try and capture a swarm. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, you can buy bees. Uh, as I said, there aren't too many people that are supplying nucleus colonies with top bars. So, you know, if you go to buy bees, they'll sell you a nucleus colony and it'll be in frames and it won't fit in your box unless you got the Tanzanian hive, so that won't work. So probably what most of you will do is you'll buy a three pound package of bees. Uh, keep in mind that the companies that supply these usually sell out by the end of January, so you need to get your order in by the end of January. What happens, somehow I managed to lose my can of syrup that sits right in here, but this will come in, there'll be a can of syrup hanging in here, there'll be a bunch of bees in here, and then there's this little queen cage that hangs right in there. There'll be a queen with two attendants in this little cage right in here. And all you have to do is you take out the queen cage and there's a little cork in the bottom. You pull out your fancy pocket knife that you use because you're a top RBI keeper or just because everybody should always have a pocket knife in your pocket. You pop that cork out and you lay that right in the bottom of your top bar hive. When you go online and start reading about some of this information and say, uh, both those forms that I talked about have specific subforms that talk about top bar hives specifically, go on, ask questions, and again, you get lots of opinions. Some will say, well, you can really encourage the bees to come into your hive or encourage a swarm to come in if you put lemongrass leaves in there. Some people say it works, some people say it doesn't. Some people will say, if you spray the inside of your hive with just a little bit of lemon pledge, that will encourage a swarm to come in. They say there's something about the lemon scent that encourages bees to come in or bees to remain in a hive. 
I'm not recommending it. I'm not discouraging it. Some people do it. I've never done it. Uh, but that's, that's something that people do. But you just take your queen cage and you put it in there. And then the worst thing, uh, I hate to see people do this, but if you see some videos online, you always see people, okay, they've put their queen cage in their hive, they've taken their serpa, and then they take their tail and they just shake the devil out of this. You don't do that. That's, that's not nice to the bees. All you want to do is you fill up your little spray bottle with a little bit of one-to-one -one sugar, water syrup, squirt the bees down a little bit, you know, they'll start grooming each other, they'll be fairly docile, and then all you have to do is you come along with your pocket knife or your uh, screwdriver or whatever, and just pop these little staples off and fold that down, and just gently pour them in there, and it's a lot better than them, they just shake that and double out of this thing. So, and that's all you really have to do. You put in your follower board and let your bees settle in there, and that's all there is to it. Any questions before we come up and take a look at this and then go over and build that? I know, <coughs> you know, this has just kind of been a real introduction. Uh, happy to help any of you with your hives and that as you get them established in that. I'm certainly not the only beekeeper around. Uh, there's lots of beekeepers. I encourage you to go to Ty's meeting or one of your own county meetings about uh, join up with the beekeeper, see who's around. I am going to be giving an hour-long talk on top bar hives, which will be this same talk, just expanded a little bit more at the January meeting as well. Um, I like the system. One of the nice things about this, one of the reasons why people don't like the Langstrauss hives is because of the weight, as we talked about earlier. You know, a full super honey, the older you get, you know, if you're just moving one super, it's not bad. But if you're moving, if you have 25 hives and you're moving three supers on each one, that's 75 supers that weigh, you know, 30 pounds each, anywhere in that ballpark, that's, like, that's a lot, that's young man's work. And I'm not getting any younger. Uh, so this is nice. Also, a standard Langstroth hive will give you about 50 pounds of honey on average. That's our Kentucky average is 50 pounds of honey, uh, or about four gallons of honey. That's a lot of honey. You know, I like honey as much as the next person, but we don't go through four gallons of honey ourselves. One of the main reasons that people get out of keeping bees, um, I used to work at Ohio State University and talk with our state beekeeper up there, Jim, too. And he said the main reason he found that people got out of beekeeping was they had so much honey they didn't know what to do with it. You know, they don't want to get into the aspect where they got to buy an extractor and bottles and all this stuff. It's just like they, they just were overwhelmed with honey. Whereas with the top bar hive, you come in, you cut one off and drop it in the bucket. If you want to, you cut two off and drop it in the bucket. You know, you're not going to get as much honey produced in one of these as you are in a Langstroth hive. Right? But that's, that's true, I, I'll admit that. Uh, but you're not going to be overwhelmed by honey either. It's cheaper. Um, you know, whatever you want. This is great for somebody if your primary interest is in pollination and just want a little honey along the side. These, a bee a hive like this will give you all the pollination you need in your garden without any problems. Um, I enjoy keeping my bees, yeah. So the entrance is going to be on the top. Yep. So do you need an entrance producer like you do on the other one? No, nope. in fact, if no questions. Why don't everybody come up and take a quick look at this and I'll point out the one design difference. But there, there may be more design differences than what Dorn came up with. But one thing that Dorn did that we didn't do on this one is the bottom is beveled so that when you look at this one, you'll see along the edge on the bottom, there's a lot of places for small height beetles to get into the pipe, which is a bad thing. Small height beetles are just a pest. They get into the hive. Um, They've been moving up from the south. They can be a real pain in the neck. Once you get them, they're tough to get rid of. With his design, it eliminates those little nooks and crannies where the beetles can get into the hive and the bees can't get at them. So I like his design. But come on up and you can take a look at this and uh, see what's going on here. And then we'll go over and start putting them together. Uh, Usually our weather is pretty good by then. And, you know, we might get a cold snap after, but usually that's on average, you're safe. Yeah, when you talk about 
help measuring them? What do you have to do? I mean, there's no pieces off the ground. No, but it's no different than a hollow tree. I mean, I, if you think that it's going to be an issue, you can always take and put the support board on the weather. So they just go dormant all week. They don't actually go dormant. Bees are active all week. That's why it's important to make sure that they have enough food to go eat. That's one of the disadvantages to this compared to the Langstraw 5. The Langstraw 5 is a stack extra super is on top if you think it's going to be real cold yeah. with this. It's limited by how much space you've got. So do you have to feed a mixture in the winter time? Uh, sometimes if it gets real cold and they're eating through their stores real quick in January of those the warm days, and you can open it up and put some feed in for them. Uh, you really don't want them to play also because if the temperature drops too quick, that's what wherever they're at, and if they're away from the all your brood is on it. And these, how much do you think? Yeah, they're not You know, and I always tell people, even if you're allergic, you can still keep bees if you carry an epipen. The price of an epipen is, and I even started keeping bees, which was about 10 years ago, because he was in kindergarten when he started. An epipen was $50 to $60, and now they're over $600. So it's just not ridiculous. Also, just take a sheet of black plastic and lay it on the ground under them to fill the glass. Yeah. <coughs> 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 